Matthew chapter 9. It's good to see you tonight. It's cold outside, but it's warm in here. Got to thank God for heat. <laughs> And of course, we thank God for the word. Amen. The title of my message tonight is, What Do You Believe? What do you believe? Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 says, And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. In other words, their faith was going to be the determining factor in their situation. It was going to determine whether they were healed from blindness or whether they stayed blind. Well, the word of the Lord for 2016 is that this is a year of breakout. Has anybody chosen to accept that word? We've heard that it's going to be a great year where you will fill in the blanks. And we've heard that God will not only take care of one blank, but multiple blanks in your life. Multiple areas in your life this year. But we've also heard that all of that is according to your faith. That although the power necessary for God to move in whatever areas of your life that you're believing for him to move in is already available. It's already supplied. Like when Jesus touched these guys, touched their eyes, the power was being applied. Yet, it is your faith that's going to grab hold of that power and cause it to bring about what God has promised you. You know, most individuals today have smartphones. And, of course, we go, to, most of us are in buildings all the time that are wired for power. And if your iPhone or your Android or whatever dies, uh, well, the power to recharge that phone is everywhere. It's around you. Right? I mean, the place is wired for power. But you've got to have a cord. Right? A cording. Right? You've got to have a cord. And you've got to plug that cord in so that the power that's in the building can now get to your phone. And you can enjoy all the things that your phone can do. Well, God's power is available in this earth. The earth is wired for power. And there's so many things God wants to do in your life, but you need the cord called faith. For God to be able to do what he wants to do. And that's true particularly in 2016. Our faith will play a major role in us experiencing a great year. In us experiencing breakout. And so tonight's message is going to help you to develop the faith necessary to receive all God wants to give you in 2016. We're going to particularly give you three revelations that's going to help you to receive anything from God. And so let's go to Mark chapter 11. Anybody ready for this? Yeah. Anybody ready to, to find out how to receive what God promised you? Yeah. Mark chapter 11 and verse 24, a very familiar scripture to many of us here, a word of faith. Of course, if we were to back up the verse 22, in fact, we'll do that. That'll help us. To understand the context, and Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe where in his heart, that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. The word therefore, I like it because he's basically saying, since verse 23 is true, this is also true. 
In fact, I love looking at this and being reminded that verse 23 lets us know faith works by saying, and verse 24 lets us know faith works by praying too. And so in verse 24, though, he gives us some specific instructions about how to pray for things. He says, whatever ye desire, what things soever ye desire. Of course, you can't do this and believe and receive somebody, some man into your life. Or, Lord, I believe and receive Mike to be my husband in Jesus' name. I got no, it doesn't work like that. Anybody glad it doesn't work like that? I don't want to be believed and received in anybody's life. You know what I mean? I'm glad it didn't work like that. Anyway, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. Anyway, what things soever ye desire, whatever it is you desire, you, you craves, one word, what that word means, uh, one definition of that word, when ye pray. So notice, if you desire something, you ought to pray. You ought to go to God about it. That tells me that God has it. But when you pray, believe that you receive them. Now, of course, the word believe here, uh, it means to have faith. And when we, at Word of Faith, have talked about faith, we've given a number of definitions that, uh, that I think are really good. And one of them is, of course, that to have faith means to be fully persuaded. Amen. And meaning there's no wavering here. I'm fully persuaded. Amen. It means to be totally confident. Yes. You know, like a rock, un unmovable, unshakable. I am completely confident. Amen. In fact, I love how one, Psalm 112, 7 talks about a man's heart who is fixed trusting in the Lord. It just, it makes me think about these signs we see on the road and how if you were to walk up to a stop sign, you probably can't move that thing because it's fixed in concrete. And that's how our hearts are supposed to be fixed, trusting whatever God said, no matter what, what winds may blow in our life. And of course, we know that faith is not of the head, it's of the heart. That man is a three-part being. You are a spirit. We often call that your heart. You, you possess a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you live in a body. So faith is of the heart. In fact, we saw that in verse 23 when he said, you shall not doubt in your heart, but shall believe. Well, what's implied there is believe in your heart. Amen. So faith is something that it, it, when you're in, an individual who's in faith, you're fully persuaded down here. You might have, be fighting some thoughts up here. And you don't just let them, you know, you know, like a bird just kind of nest in your, in your brain. You got to deal with those thoughts. But, but you're, you're fully persuaded down here. You're totally confident down here. You're like a rock down here. And the Bible's telling us that's what we need to do when we pray. When we come to God about a matter, we need to be, be at a place where we're fully persuaded that God is going to give me what I asked for. We're fully persuaded. We're fully confident that when I get done praying, this thing will be done. I will have it. But notice something about faith that is illustrated in the scripture because he says when you pray, believe that. Believe that. And see, you must come to God believing something specific. Here he's saying you need to believe that you receive. If you were to back of the verse 23, when he talks about using your words in faith, he says believe that what you say will come to pass. When it comes to your salvation, if you remember Romans 10, 9, and 10, it says if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead. Amen. You know those different things that are mentioned there? It, in Romans chapter 4, we'll probably look at that a little later, but it says that Abraham believed that he would be the father of many nations. So you can see here that faith must be specific. And I want to go a step farther and say that there are some beliefs, some things that we must believe before we're ready to believe we receive. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Before we're at a place where we say, Father, I pray for this and I believe I receive it, now I got it. 
Yeah, that's it. Glory to God. Before we get to that place where we believe we receive, there's some other beliefs we're going ha- to need to have. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Of course, this, is, this chapter talks about faith a lot. You find the word faith 27 times in 40 scriptures, and you find a mention of 16 Old Testament champions of faith in this chapter. And verse 6 is one of the, I don't know, one of the main scriptures in this chapter. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, well, what's that? what is that called? Prayer. He's telling us something about prayer. When you come to God, you must, because this, this is just the law of the universe, like gravity, you're going to receive from God, you must believe. No matter what you're coming about, you must believe. And there are some specific things you must believe. You must believe that he is, who? God. And that, see, believe that. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when I come to God, I must believe that he is. When I come to God, I must believe that he is a rewarder. And actually what we're seeing, what we can find in the scripture are a couple of things that we're going to need to believe before we're really able to believe we receive. It's kind of like if you're building a house, you got to put in the first floor before you can put on the second floor. And you got to put in the second floor before you can put on the third floor. Or, or, for example's sake, let's, let's just talk about these steps on the stage. I'm going to have to believe something. on. I got to get to this step before I can get to this step. Before I can get to this step. Before I believe I receive. Now stay with me because I'm, I'm going to prove it to you. But I want you to grab a hold of this right now. Clearly, I've got to believe a couple things before I'll get to the place where I outright believe I receive. And this might be where some people have missed it. So what are those things? Go to Ephesians chapter 3. You know what? Keep your finger here in Hebrews 11. We're going we're gonna to stay here in Hebrews and then we'll go to Ephesians. Somebody say believe. funny how this works. You know, in Colossians 1, you have a very interesting prayer, and I'm not going to take you there because I know what group I'm talking to, so you guys can look it up later. But Colossians 1, 9 through 11, you see the Colossians prayer, and the prayer is that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So filled with knowledge, right? Revelation, ultimately, is what it's talking about. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that we being rooted and grounded in love. Oh, I said that. Now I went to Ephesians 3 prayer. <laughs> Uh, that you might be filled with, and it goes on to say that you might be filled, and it says increasing in knowledge. So basically the prayer is such that you're praying that you get knowledge so that later on you can increase in knowledge. I got to get it so I can increase in it. I got to get to the first floor before I can even get to the second floor. I got to learn uh, addition before I can understand subtraction. I got to get multiplication before I can get to division. And you see this in the kingdom of God, that revelation is progressive, and and it seems our faith walk is similar. Well, Hebrews chapter 11, I blew that up when I quoted the wrong scripture, but I think you got it. Verse 6 again, let's focus on this, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, must believe that he is, must believe that he is. Is. Well, what does that mean to believe that he is? Well, of course, first of all, it means to believe that he exists. I mean, you can't say, well, God, if you're there, help me. I mean, no, that doesn't work. Unless he's just very merciful. <laughs> you got to believe he exists. But to believe God is, is to believe God is. Did you understand what I just said? Because 
God is all powerful, right? If I believe God is, I believe there is an entity out there, an individual who is able to do all kinds of anything I can think of. And that's the first revelation that you need. And that is that you need to believe that God is able. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Who are you talking about? God. And you know, a lot of times we look at this opening of Scripture and we get caught up in the exceeding abundantly above, and we should. It's amazing. But if we were just to take that out right now, we could read it. Now unto him that is able to do all that we ask or think. You see that? To him that is able. He has the ability. He has the might to do all we ask. In fact, all we think. Anything you can ask God, God is able to do it. Anything you can even think of asking God, God is able to do it. It's like some of y'all didn't hear what I just said. Let me say this again. I said anything you can even think of asking God, God is able to do it. Can God heal you from cancer? Can God get you out of debt? Can God cause your marriage to be whole? Can God save your kids? Can God take this building and pick it up and put it all the way across town? Yeah, he could. God is able to do whatever you can ask and whatever you can think. The Bible says he framed the worlds with the words of his mouth and he still holds them up, not with his hands, but just with his words. He is able to do whatever you ask. Whatever you ask. And you got to believe that. Go to Romans chapter 4. Come on, that's the first step here. The first thing I got to believe before I believe I can receive is to believe he's able. I won't believe I receive it if I don't believe he can give it. Do you believe he's able to fill in the blank in your life? Do you believe he's able to break you out of whatever prison you're in? Come on, I'm talking to you tonight. Do you believe those things? Do you believe God can do it? Do you believe God can do it? Do you believe God can do it? Turn up and tell him, I believe God can do it. Come on, that's where Abraham got. That's the place he got to. God was telling this man that, hey, I know you're about 100. Your wife is 90. She's barren, but I'm giving you all a child. And they, he laughed when he first heard it. She laughed when she first heard it. And I love how God named their son Isaac, which means laughter. <laughs> but how did, he, how did that happen? He had to believe it. And you notice what the Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, he against hope believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God. Through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was, he was, he was able to perform. He got to the place where he believed that God had the ability to heal Sarah and if necessary to revitalize his body enough so that they could have a child. He believed it. He believed God was able, and so God was able to do it. The first thing you're going to have to believe is that God's able to do it in your life. Is he able to do it? Sometimes we get caught up in looking at uh, the circumstance and get caught up in how the world works and what people say or what we think we've experienced in the past. But you got to make a point of not forgetting how big God is. How even if you don't see a way, God always has a way. How you, the people may say it's impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. You need to believe that he is able because he is. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Somebody say believe. Believe. 
I believe he's able. I believe he's able. We ought, to, we ought to really have the mentality that many of us have when we go to work, go to the bank after getting paid. A lot of us get paid by direct deposit. What does that mean? Well, they didn't put cash into your hands. Right? You got a piece of paper. And the paper lets you know that money has been put into your account. And when you go to the bank to withdraw those funds, you don't even think about if the money's there. Because you are confident that your company is able to pay that money. If you weren't confident of that, you would not work there. You are confident that the company has the money, they're able to make sure the money gets into your account, so you go not even thinking about whether or not the money is going to be there. You're thinking about how you're going to spend the money. And that's really how we've got to, we got to get to the place where we realize that our paper is the word of God. Man, we got this right here in my hand. And, and God is able to do what he said he's going to do. So I'm not even worried about, I'm not thinking about if God's going to do this. I know he's able. I know he's got the ability. I'm going, thinking about what life's going to be like now that God has pulled this thing off. And that's how we ought to be this year, boy. We ought to be excited like, whoa, it's going to be so good. It's going to be a great year because I know God's able to do it. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Here's another revelation we need to grab a hold of. The first one, of course, was that God is able. The next is that God is willing. I'm on my way to believe and I receive. I got to believe that he is willing. And here he's telling us that. You got to believe that he is a rewarder. He rewards those that seek him. How many know that God would not do something that he doesn't want to do. You know what I mean by that? You're not going to twist God's arm behind his back and make him do something he's not willing to do. And God says in his word over and over again that he is a God who is a rewarder. He is a God who is willing to bless people. In fact, if you were to go to James chapter 1, the Bible tells us there that God gives liberally. Why would he give liberally if he didn't want people to have it? Amen. Go to Psalm 145. Amen. You need to believe that he is willing. Psalm 145, verse 8. Notice something about God's character. It reads, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all. Somebody say, he's good to me. He's good to me. And his tender mercies are over all his works. That means they're over me, right? Notice how this, these two scriptures started. The Lord is gracious. He is gracious. Now, that word gracious comes from a, a Hebrew root word, which means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inf inferior. It also means to favor or to bestow. When I was meditating and thinking about this, I thought about someone who's always given to homeless people. You know, you go out with them and you hang out with them and, and somebody's on the side and they're asking for, for, for some money and they always reach in their pocket. Everywhere you go, they, they, they're blessing somebody. What is, that's somebody that's gracious. Their nature is to give. Their nature is to bless because they're compassionate. And that is actually a great representation of God. God is gracious. He's disposed to show favor. He is someone who is willing to bless anybody. I mean, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro 
throughout the earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. In other words, God's actually looking for people that will allow him to give to, him, to, them, to, to them. He is eager. He's not just willing. He's eager to give. I mean, when you're looking, you're eager. Wait, wait, wait. You know, somebody going to give me something. Right? You know, we had our last uh, Lions game on Sunday, and and, you know, and, and, there were, and there are times in the game where, you know, the quarterback gets the ball, in our case, Matthew Stafford, and he drops back, and he's eager to get rid of that ball because he's got a couple 300-pound men coming at him trying to take his head off, and if he can get rid of the ball, they don't get to touch him. But if he holds on to that ball, he might die. So what he do? He backs up, and he's looking for any receiver that is open. And this last Sunday, Calvin Johnson was open a lot. So he's, he, he's throwing the ball to Calvin, throwing the ball to Calvin. And that's how God is. God is not holding on to your blessings, you know, laughing. He's holding on, but he's waiting for you to get open. He, he's waiting for you to put your hand up and say, I'm open. I'm open. Anybody open in this place tonight? And he's, he's always ready to deliver the pass, man. He's, he's, he's willing. He's eager to get to you what he promised you. This is a part of his plan for your life. And he takes pleasure in your prosperity when you are doing well, when you are enjoying the desires of your heart. He enjoys that. Just like a parent does at, on Christmas Day when that child gets what they want and they go running around the house. You know, just the other day, we got my, my oldest daughter, one of those hoverboards. We got it from a reputable place. <laughs> so it didn't explode on us. You know, we did our research. And we had to ship it because we were in Louisiana for Christmas and, and, you know, where my wife's mother is. And so, you know, they won't let you put that thing on a plane anymore. So we had to ship it. So she had to, she played with it for about a day and then she hadn't seen it. And it showed up maybe two days ago. And she was so excited. You know, she, my 12-year-old is kind of cool. <laughs> Laid back. You know, if she gets excited about something, that's something. She was so excited, man, and then she ran downstairs with it, you know, and she's, you know, rolling around in this thing, and, and, and you know what? I just, I loved it. As a father, it's like, man, this is cool to see her excited about something, and, you know, this is all she want to do. I said, man, that, that, that's, that's great, and that's, and the Bible tells us that, you know, that's how we are as parents. How much more does God love us? How much more would God give good things to those that ask him to his children. God, he's willing to give you what you want. He's willing to fill in the blank this year. It was his idea. Come on, go to Matthew chapter 8. You got to grab a hold of this. You got to believe this. Believe that he's willing. You're not forcing God to do something he doesn't want you to do. You're not bombarding the gates of heaven. You know, you don't have, just have to hang on to some technicality that'll make God fill in your blank. It's quite the opposite. God's been saying, I want to fill in your blank, and I want to do it so much that I'm just going to declare a year of filling in the blank so you'll finally believe me for it. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. What's he saying? You are able. Okay, so he was here. You're able. But he wasn't here. You're willing. He's waiting to see if Jesus is going to say, yeah, I, I, I'm willing. And of course, what did Jesus say? It's, it's something all of us can hold on to because God is no respecter of persons. What he does for one, he'll do for another. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. That showed compassion. This guy probably hadn't been touched for years. He has leprosy. It's contagious. But Jesus puts forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. That's what God's saying to you tonight. I will. I will. What's your blank? I will. In other words, what are you believing for? I will. I love you so much. I will. 
You need to believe that tonight. You need to believe that's what Jesus is sitting in heaven saying. I will take care of your family. I will take care of your business. I will give you that desire of your heart. I will open that door for you. I will give you that husband or that wife you can believe in God for. I will. You need to believe that he is willing because he is. Go to 1 John chapter 5. When you go to a restaurant and order food, you know, you don't sit at the table and fret about whether or not it's coming, whether or not they really want to give you what you asked for, right? You know that they will because you know they want your money, right? So, you know, it's not, it's not motivated by love, but you know they will. So you order your food and then you kick back and you talk and you laugh and you drink whatever water they bring your way. But once again, you, you're not fretting about this thing. And we ought to be the same way, man. If we can have confidence in Nicola's or confidence in whatever restaurant you happen to like to go to. How about having confidence in God? I know he will. So once I put the order in, I can just sit back and rest. I know because of his love, he's going to bring it to pass. I said go to 1 John 5, but we can look at Hebrews 11 as well. I'll just read it to you if need be. Look at our third one here. We've got to have a hold of. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you've got to believe that he is a rewarder of them. Uh, and, and get this, it doesn't help you just to believe that God will reward my neighbor. The idea here is that you're believing that God's going to reward you. You actually have to believe that God is in the rewarding business. You realize that? You can't just believe that he's able. You can't just believe that he wants to do it. you got to believe that he's actually doing it. God's actually rewarding people all over the place. God's rewarding, and I believe God's going to reward me. In fact, I believe that once I prayed, he's already done. He's doing it. He starts the process. And that's the third thing we got to believe. I'll say it this way, even though it may not be the uh, good English or the best way of saying it. you got to believe that God is giving. That's the third one, that God is actually giving, that he is a giver. Amen. In 1 John chapter 5, I hope you get this. It's that last step. Verse 14 says, and this is the confidence, the assurance, right? That's a faith word, confidence. We could almost say this is the faith that we have in him. What is that? That if we ask anything, there's that word anything again. You might look at that Sunday. According to his will, he heareth us. Well, that's something to shout about right there. I don't have to wonder if my prayers got past the ceiling. If I'm a follower of Jesus and I pray according to whatever's on the menu, God hears me. And the good thing is it's a big menu. The Bible says he's given us exceeding great and precious promises so we could partake of the divine life, man, the God kind of life. There's a promise for all kinds of things that God's made available to us. So we know we pray according to his will. He hears us. But here's where it gets really interesting. And if we know that he hear us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. This points to his character, to his nature. We just saw that. He's gracious. He's willing. But this goes a step farther than that because it's telling us that when we, we know he gives when we ask. You get that? For me to know I have would mean I know he gives. Some of y'all, you didn't catch this. I'll give you a second for your lightning quick mind, as Bishop would say. 
to catch up with that. For me to know I have, I got to know he gives. So he's telling me here, this is the confidence I have in him. Another way you could say it, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. And if he hears me, he gives it to me. And if he gives it, I know I have it. We know he gives when we ask. He gives when we ask. Isn't that what Mark eleven twenty four 24 is telling us? What, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it. For me to believe I receive it means I got to believe that he gave it. Right? I got to believe before I believe I, I got it. I got to believe he gave it. I got to believe that when I said in Jesus name that all the heavens start working. Remember what the angel told Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, I believe it is? Daniel was praying for wisdom, and it took three weeks before the angel showed up. But the angel said, when the words were spoken, when you spoke the words, I was sent. When soon as he got done praying to God, God had dispatched an angel to give him what he asked for. And I don't believe that was a one-time thing because I believe angels do the heavy lifting in the realm of the spirit. When we pray in the name of Jesus, as soon as we say in the name of Jesus, I believe that that Kevin's power gets to work and God is giving to you what he asked, what you asked him for. Which is one reason why when you're in that time frame between amen and there it is, you don't need to get all upset because all I know is that he gives. And if he gives and I haven't seen it yet, that's because he's still working. That my blessing is still loading. But it's just a matter of time before it is here and I have what God promised me. When you have that mentality, your attitude is different. Come on, go to John chapter 11. You need to believe that God is giving. He's giving it right now. He's giving it right now. It, 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 it's, he's, he's taking care of business. Look at John chapter 11. You really need to believe that God gave it when you prayed. You realize that? That's really what I, 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 if I were to be even more technical, I'm really believing that when I said in Jesus name, he gave it. You see that? I, 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 he, he's a giver and he gave it. As soon as I said, father, do this in my money, he gave it. Done. Heal my body this, he gave it. I heard earlier during healing service where, where you know, it was said, hey, put your hand on your thyroid and let's, let's pray for people's thyroids. And I, you know, and, 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 and I heard that and, and the prayer was done and in Jesus' name, and I was, I was saying, hey, that's it. He gave it. He gave it. Many of us put our faith out there on New Year's Eve for certain things, and when you prayed it, he gave it. You got to believe he's a giver. That whenever I come to him and ask, he gives. He gives. He, he's not holding stuff back, man. He's not, you know, he's not even saying, well, you know, um, I, 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 I want to. If you, if you believe, he's able to give. So once you believe it, know that it's done. Jesus understood that in John chapter 11. Here's the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was dead, been dead for four days. And Jesus really seemed to be under instruction from God about how he handled this whole thing. So I won't read the whole story to you, but he eventually said to Martha, Lazarus' sister, roll the stone away. And, you know, she had some things to say about it. And he said, hey, you know, if you believe you'll see the glory of God and you can see what God was able and God was willing and then he, it says in verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. What's he saying? You've already given it. You realize that? You've already given it. It's already done. When I prayed, you heard me, you gave it, and I got it. 
Oh, that's good right there. When I prayed, you heard me, you gave it, and I got it. I thank you, Lord, I already got it. And when you believe you got it, it will impact how you act. Verse 43, and so when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Jesus was able to boldly declare Lazarus come forth because he believed the work was already done. It, God was just waiting on him to act on what he told him to do. And when he believed, when I prayed, you heard me, you gave it, I have it. Now let's, jump, let's go ahead and do this thing. And, and, and that's something you see all throughout the Bible. When God told Israel to walk around Jericho, you know, seven days and seven times on the seventh day. And then he said, shout because the Lord has given you the city. He expected them to believe that God already gave the victory. And they just needed to go ahead and thank God for the victory. And while they were thanking God for the victory, it showed up. I'm here to tell you that God didn't speak a word into your life thinking about how he's going to do something. He already lined things up in your life to cause these things to come to pass. And if you've used your faith about this matter, God's already done it. You might as well start declaring that I got the victory. You already, you might as well start praising God that you got the victory. You might as well go ahead and start praising and dancing because you know you got the victory. Because God is a giver who has given you what you've asked for. You got to believe that. You got to believe he's a giver. You got to believe that when I ask, God gives it. And I believe that God is able. And I believe that God is willing. And I believe that God is a giver. Now I'm ready to come before God and believe I receive it. And I will have it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good days are coming. Good days are coming. A great year is here. Ha ha, a great year is here. A year of breakout. A year of breakthrough. A year we'll look back and say, Lord God, you filled in so many different blanks in my life because you're good and you're faithful. And because I did what was necessary to believe. We'll talk more about that on Sunday. Come on, lift your hands.